3 through 5. And Paul writes this to Timothy. I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing, I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Good evening, everyone. Or maybe I should say afternoon. I'm not sure what the breakdown is between afternoon and evening. This being the first Sunday of the month, we have two sermons. And maybe you all drew the short stick, but you got me tonight. And I'm sure I've stunned everybody because my reading was now the Old Testament. But that's okay. So we need to know both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I appreciate the songs that Brother Jeff led. He asked me this morning what type of songs we I said, just lead church songs and we'll be okay. And I think he did a good job. We're going to talk a little bit tonight about legacy. What I mean by legacy is this. What we create during our lifetime is our reputation. What we leave behind us when we're gone is our legacy. And what has inspired me to talk about this tonight this happens to be the 121st birthday of my grandmother, Ruth Schaus. And there's not too many people in this room that know who that is. But that is my grandmother, Ruth Schaus, my father's mother. She was born on March the 5th of 1902. And that little fat boy she's holding right there, that's me. <laughs> that's taken in June of 1955. So you do the math, I was about three months old. So you figure out how old Mr. Randy's going to be here. But when I think about my grandmother, I think about the fact that she was not very well educated, only went through eighth grade. When she was growing up in the early 19-teens in Owen County, the general thought is women didn't need much education, and she didn't have much formal education. But she loved the Bible, she loved God, and you know she had a way with children. Now, some people say I have a way with children, and if I have a way with children, I get that as a legacy from my grandmother Ruth there. Now more people might know who that is, perhaps. That is my same grandmother Ruth, 38 years ago, March 5th of 1983, which happened to be her last birthday that she had here on earth. And that young man right there, she is holding, is Joel and Sarah's older brother, Nathan. That's Roger's oldest boy. And she was holding him there and uh, Again, I don't know if Nathan has any recollection of her or not. I don't know. He was only about two and a half years old at that time. But that's what inspired me to talk a little bit tonight about what sort of legacy are we building. After I'm gone, what will people say about Randy Schaus? Well, you've heard a little bit about what I think about Ruth Schaus. But what will they say about me? And we have examples of legacy in the Bible. For example, in Matthew chapter 3, we read about John the Baptist. And John was preaching a baptism of repentance. He was a forerunner of Christ. He was contemporary with Christ. He was about six months older than Jesus was in human terms. And starting in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 7, we read here, but when he saw, he being John here, many of the Pharisees, and by the way, I'm reading from the New American Standard, so if it varies just a little bit, it won't, it won't uh, matter about the content. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones God is able to raise up children to Abraham. Now it's interesting that John here makes the reference to Abraham. When John was saying this, Abraham had been dead for 2,000 years. No one he was talking to would have any idea who Abraham was. Wouldn't even have pictures. They didn't have photographs back in those days. But Abraham carried a legacy that 2,000 years after his death meant something to the Jews. We're children of Abraham. Jesus ran into the same thing if we turn over to uh, John chapter 8. When Jesus was beginning his ministry, 
that same person, Abraham, was, was brought up to Jesus as someone who is our forefathers. Starting with verse 31 in John chapter 8. So Jesus was saying to the Jews who had believed him, If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered, they answered him, We are Abraham's descendants, and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will be, uh, become free? Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does not remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants. Yet you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. If I speak the words which I, I speak the words, excuse me, which I have seen in my father, therefore you are also to do the things which you heard from your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Then Jesus said to them, if you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. Now it's interesting how the Jews, they didn't say we're the, we're the children of Isaac, but they were. We're the children of Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, which their name came from. No, they go back to Abraham. Because Abraham's legacy was such that even 2,000 years after he had left this earth, he was somebody that the Jews looked up to. And Jesus recognized that, and John recognized that, and so they used their reverence, as it were, for Abraham to demonstrate that Christ had come, the seed of Abraham, to fulfill the promises that were first made to Abraham 2,000 years before. Remember when God said to Abraham, from your seed all nations shall be blessed. And that was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Later on, the Apostle Paul in the letter of Galatians also refers back to Abraham, interestingly enough. Galatians chapter 3, helps if I get in the right book, not 2 Corinthians, how about Galatians, here we go, Galatians chapter 3. Let's start with the very first verse to get the context here. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, how are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Even so, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. Again, that imagery. The Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the nations will be blessed in you. So then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. Again, isn't it interesting how Paul, again, reflects back not on one of the other Jewish heroes or, or people that people know, again, not on Isaac, not on Jacob, not on Moses, but refers back to Abraham. Because Abraham's legacy was such that even 2,000 years after he had left this earth, the Jewish people would say, we're children of Abraham. We put our faith in Abraham. We believe in Abraham because of what Abraham stood for and what they understood that Abraham stood for in the legacy that he left. We have another person prominent in the Bible as far as legacy. That's young David. And this is a picture of David, of course, and Goliath, which the kids know when we teach them our Bible lessons. But it's interesting, as we read about David... We read about a man who wasn't perfect by any means, but a man who future kings are always referred to as either he was a man after God's own heart like David, or he was not like David. David was held up as the personification of what it meant to be a follower of God. Let's look in 1 Kings at a couple places. You knew I'd get back to the Old Testament eventually. 1 Kings chapter 15. Now, in the 18th year of King Jeroboam, 
the son of Nebat, Abijam became king over Judah. He reigned three years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Makah, the daughter of Absalom. He walked in all the sins of his father, which he had committed before him, and his heart was not wholly devoted to the, to the Lord his God, like the heart of his father David. But for David's sake, verse 4 of 1 Kings chapter 15, for David's sake the Lord his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem to raise up his son after him and establish Jerusalem, because David did what was right in the sight of the Lord, and had not turned aside from anything that he commanded him, except all the days of his life, except in the case of Uriah the Hittite. But again, David by this time, when we're reading here, David had been dead for over 50 years. And yet the writer says, if you're going to follow God's recipe, God's pattern for being a king, you need to be like King David. Later on in the 15th chapter, well, excuse me, in 2 Kings, let's go to 2 Kings now, chapter, chapter 18. And now we're over 200 years from the time that David had died. 2 Kings chapter 18, starting with the very first verse. Now it came about in the third year of Hosea, the son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, became king. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abai, the daughter of Zechariah. He did right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father David had done. Now again, David was not Hezekiah's literal father. David had been dead for over 200 years by this time, but yet David is still held up as this is the ideal of what it means to be a king. Later on in that same 18th chapter of 2 Kings, well, let's go to the 22nd chapter, because there's a lot of verses we can look at, but we won't look at all of them for sake of time. We read about another king. Now this was a king of another 50 years beyond Hezekiah, so now David's been gone for over 300 years. 2 Kings chapter 22. Josiah was 8 years old, very first verse, when he became king. And he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Jedidiah, the daughter of Adiah of Boscath. He did right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the ways of his father, David. Not Solomon, not the man who wrote Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, the Song of Solomon, but David. Because David's legacy, David's reputation, what David had done during his lifetime, rightly or wrongly, stood up as a beacon for future kings of Israel. He did right in the sight of his Lord and walked in the way of his father David and did not turn aside to the right or to the left. Jesus makes reference to David in Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Now by the time that Jesus came along, David had been dead for a thousand years. Because he was about, was about 2,000 years to Abraham and about a thousand years to David. And yet in the 22nd chapter of the, of the of book of Matthew... Starting with verse 41. Now when the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, then how does David in the spirit call him Lord? Saying, and here he's quoting from the Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath my feet. If David calls him Lord, how is he his son? No one was able to answer him a word, nor did anyone dare from that day on to ask him another question. It's interesting, when Jesus asked, who do I come from, where am I at? They didn't say, well, you're the son of Mary and Joseph, or you're the son of Hezekiah, or you're the son of Solomon, or even you're the son of Abraham. They said, you're the son of David. Because again, even a thousand years after he had left this earth, David's reputation was such, his legacy was such, that he was looked up as a beacon of what God wanted you to be. Over Mark, one more reference to David here, Mark chapter 16, excuse me, Mark chapter 10, verse 16. The story of what they sometimes call blind Bartimaeus. Mark chapter 10, excuse me, verse 46, I said 16, I can't read my own handwriting, I guess it's pretty bad. 
Then they came to Jerusalem, Mark 10, 46. And as he was leaving Jericho, his disciples and a large crowd and a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. When he heard that it was Jesus the Nazarene, he began to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many were sternly telling him to be quiet, but he kept crying out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And of course, we know the rest of the story. Jesus healed that blind man. But it's interesting that even this Bartimaeus, this person who, whose knowledge of Jesus was somewhat rudimentary, calls him the Son of David because David had left a legacy of what it meant to be a godly individual, just like Abraham had led a, a legacy of what it meant to be a godly individual. So the question for us tonight, what's our legacy? What's our legacy going to be? How will people remember us after we're gone? We won't be famous like David or Abraham. We'll be more like Ruth Shouse. If only a few people know who she is here in this audience. But how will people speak about us? How will people speak about us as husbands? You know, we have instruction from God of what it means to be a husband. What commitments you are making as a husband. In Ephesians chapter 5, a verse I often read when I called upon to do wedding ceremony. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husband, love your wives. How? Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her so he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water of the word, so that he might present himself, excuse me, so that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to also love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. You know, most of us here that are of a certain age have married. Are we willing to make that commitment to our wives? We should be. It's what Christ tells us to do. Love your wives as Christ loves the church. Maybe we need to improve on that a little bit. What will people say about Randy Shouse when I'm gone? What type of husband was he? What I do now will reflect on what people will say, will reflect on my legacy. And wise, we don't want to leave you out either. Proverbs chapter 31. Another passage I like to read at wedding ceremony. Proverbs written by the wise man Solomon. Kind of a tragic figure when we study him. Someone who's given wisdom but got himself in trouble. Proverbs chapter 31. We're just going to read a few verses, but really you could start with verse 10 and read through verse 31. But starting with verse 10, Solomon wives, writes, An excellent wife who can find for her worth is far above jewels. Some translations there say rubies. In other words, an excellent wife is more valuable than any material possession that we have. Then let's skip down to verse 30. Charm is deceitful. Beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. If you're here in a wife, I doubt there's too many ladies here that say, I'm just as beautiful as I was the day I was married. I can tell I'm not as beautiful as the day I was married. I've got picture proof. You can tell that. Because as we age, we lose our beauty, don't we? Despite all the products out there to try to keep us making look younger and things like that, there's so much emphasis on physical beauty. Solomon says, what beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. If you're a wife, if you're a woman, are you laying down a legacy that you feared God, that you respected God, that you loved God? Will your children be able to say, you know what, mom loved God. Mom was one who was always at church. Dad loved God. He was always at church. He we always knew what we needed to do on Sundays. And on Wednesdays, if your service happens to be on Wednesday night. And then sometimes as husband and wife, we choose to bring children into the world, don't we? And remember, those children have no choice. Whitney and Olivia and Allison didn't have any choice about whether they be born or not. It happened. 
They didn't have any choice where they had me and, as a dad and Lita as a mom. It happened. But in Ephesians chapter 6, God gives us instructions, doesn't he? Fathers, he says in verse 4, do not provoke your children in anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Are we building that legacy as fathers when we bring children in the world? Here's what we're going to talk about. Here's what we're going to do. It's not a question on Sunday, well, are we going to go to church today? Are we going to go out and play? Are we going to do something? You know, it's a beautiful day today. You know, fall, spring, you know, we're all here. We're not prepared for the snow, I'm sure, which will come because we've had a warm February and things always even out in Indiana. Or do our children know Sunday's the day we devote to worshiping God? And that's what Paul wrote about, as Tim read for us in 2 Timothy. He talked about the legacy when he's talking to Timothy. When he says there in verse 5, For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, the you being Timothy there, the sincere faith was within you which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. And I'm sure that is in you as well. Three generations right there. Grandmother, a mother, and Timothy. Again, an example of how to raise children right. How to raise children to respect God. We have some families in here that may have four or five generations. And again, realize that those older generations have, don't, have, 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 gone, have gone and died and gone out. Ruth's house has been dead for over 35 years. But her devotion to God still lives on in me and I hopefully will live on to my children. If I'm doing the things I need to do. Now children, we're not going to let you off the hook either. Back to Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to read the first few verses of Ephesians chapter 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, verse 1. For this is right, honor your father and your mother. That's one way back in Exodus chapter 20, the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Now, it's possible you may have parents that aren't in the Lord. But if you look at that next verse, it doesn't say, well, honor your father and mother because they're Christians. It says, honor you. You still have to give them honor. You still have to respect them, even if you think that they're wrong. Even if you think that they are not as devoted to God as they should be. You are to honor your father and your mother. Back in the book of Proverbs, when we were reading about the excellent wife in, in Proverbs chapter 31, there's an interesting verse here in that soliloquy that Solomon gives about an excellent wife. Proverbs chapter 31, in verse 28, talking about the excellent wife, who can, who can find in verse 28, she says, Her children rise up and bless her, her husband also. And he praises her, saying, Many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. Children should rise up and bless and honor their mother. That's, that's part of our responsibility as children. We have responsibilities as employers or employees, don't we? If you're an employer, you have a responsibility to treat your, treat your workers correctly, to be fair with them, to properly oversee them. In the 90th Psalm, the psalmist there writes, starting with verse 13, he says, do, uh, do return, O Lord, how long will it be, and be sorry for your servants. O satisfy us, verse 14, in the morning with your loving kindness, that we may sing for joy and be glad all of our days. Make us glad according to the days you have afflicted us and the years we have seen evil. Let your work appear to your servants and your majesty to their children. Now, this is talking about God. But the application applies to a boss, employee. Let your work appear to your servants. Are you the type of employer that says, well, you do it, but I'm not going to do it. You do this, but I'm not too, I'm too good to do this, or I'm too important to do this. Or do you lead by example? You know, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. We need to live the type of life to be an example. 
2 Timothy chapter 2. And again, I realize the context is talking in a religious sense, but I think it also applies to us as employees. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the, handling the word of truth. Now, again, the concept is in our religious life, but again, can we see how it applies to us as employees, as a workman who does not need to be ashamed. You know, I've been around in my younger days. I'm an, I'm an employer now, but when I was an employee, I had some co-employees that would say, if I can get away and, you know, sleep on the job for a couple hours and still draw my pay, that's what, exactly what I'm going to do. That's not what God says. That's, that's not what God tells us to be employees. You know, we live in a time right now where we've got Lawyers everywhere. And I'm speaking that because I'm a lawyer. But my grandfather, Ruth's husband, Otto Schaus, worked for 55 years, never had a written contract in his life because you know how he made a deal? Shook somebody's hand. And your word was your bond. We don't live in that type of world anymore. It'd be nice if we did, but we don't. But the concept was back in those days, in the 1920s and 1930s and 1940s, you didn't need a whole big, long, complicated contract. If your employer gave you your word and shook your hand on it, that was good enough. Employers knew to treat their employees fairly, and employees knew that they could depend on their employer. Well, unfortunately, we don't live in that type of world anymore. But that's the concept that should be with us as Christians if we are going to set the type of legacy that we want to be set. That that person was a good employee. That person was a good employer. You could depend upon him. He would give you an honest day's work. And I'm going to give him an honest day's pay. But finally, let's look at what sort of legacy we are leaving in our spiritual lives. You know, in the 22nd chapter of Matthew, Jesus was asked by the disciples... What's the great commandment of the law? You know, we like to deal with lists and deal, you know, what's the best and what's the best, what's the best hamburger place, what's the best movie, what's the best this, what's the best that. And people weren't, weren't that different 2,000 years ago. Because they came to Jesus in Matthew 22 and verse 36, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? In other words, which one is number one? You remember what Jesus said? He said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul. This is the great and foremost commandment. That's what God tells us. Are we setting the type of legacy that they can say, oh, that Randy Schaus, he, he loved God. He demonstrated it. Or are we leaving, leaving some other type of legacy? Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, uh, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for what? That's right, righteousness. You're right, Charles. For they shall be filled. We're told in Colossians chapter 3 that we have to set our minds on things above. We have to focus on what's good, what's right. The Philippian brother, uh, the letter tells us to focus on the lovely things, focus on the good things. There's so much bad in this world, we can't get away from it, but we can focus on what's good and we can set an example for our co workers, for our children, for our neighbors what it means to be a child of God. And going along with that in Philippians chapter 2. Because actually Jesus talks about it in Matthew 22. The second, the second is likened to it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And that's easy to the mouth. That's easy to say, oh sure, I'll love my neighbor as myself. But in Philippians chapter 2, Paul kind of puts the rubber to the road, so to speak. Philippians chapter 2, he says, starting in verse 3, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. You know, we live in a world where we say, I want to do what I want to do. I want to look after me. You've got to look after number one, and I should be number one. God said, shouldn't be. Shouldn't be. God should be number one. Who's number two? Our neighbor, isn't it? Our neighbor. Do not merely look out, verse 4, for your own personal interests, 
but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Can you imagine, and, and we can't, it, 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 our minds I don't think are able to grasp, but can you imagine having the power to speak the world in existence, having the power to speak the stars into existence if it's, a, if it's a clear night, and I go out and look at the stars. Those were spoken into existence. And yet being willing as a being who has that power and has that authority, and also a being who has the authority to end all of this anytime he wants to. Come down to this world and go through the things that Christ did. Not for his sake, but for our sake. Jesus embodied the idea he was thinking about us. We, as, as Christians, need to think about each other. You need to think about, well, it's not best for Randy Shouse, but what's best for this person? What's best for this person? What's best for that person? And that gets increasingly difficult, again, in a world where everything around us tells us yourself should be number one. That's not what God says. What type of legacy are we building? What type of legacy are we leaving for our children and for generations that will follow? You know, I have a lot of Friends who have gone on to their reward. I remember people like Dick Hoggett and Mac Wood who have gone on to their reward. But what they stood for can guide me in today. And perhaps you're here tonight and you're wondering about, well, maybe I need to make some changes to my legacy. Number one, the change you need to make if you haven't done it yet is say, I'm going to follow Christ. I'm going to set an example of what it means to be a Christian. And if you're here tonight and not a Christian, you can remedy that right now. Because Jesus says himself, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, 16, Matthew 28, 19, and 20, he told the disciples, go into all the world and teach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, there's nothing magical about this water. You know, I bring the kids up here because they're interested about the water. There's nothing magical about the water, but it is an act of obedience to the creator of this world who says, that's what I want you to do. And that Ethiopian eunuch was there in Acts chapter 8 and had ridden a thousand miles in a chariot, dusty roads, and was reading his Bible. And for him, his Bible was the Old Testament. And was reading in Isaiah, and Philip was miraculously brought to him, and Philip began at that passage he was at and spoke to him Jesus. That's all it tells us, spoke to him Jesus. And the very next verse says, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What prevents me or what hinders me from being baptized? Now, you don't have to be a Rhodes Scholar to figure out if you're going to preach Jesus, you're going to preach baptism. It tells us that right there. Remember what Philip said? If you truly believe, you can. If you're willing to make that commitment, you can. Or if you're here tonight and you have not and living the type of life that Christ wants you to lead. If you're not leaving that legacy, you can change your legacy because you're still alive. You can't change it after you're gone. But you can change it and get your heart back right with God. He's patient towards us. He loves us. He doesn't want any of us to perish. But the onus is on us to do the things that he wants us to do. And you know what? It's nice. He's given us right here in, in written form and you don't have to be a Greek scholar to understand it. You don't have to have a Harvard education to understand it, we can all understand it. If we have difficulty understanding it, guess what? We can work together and we can figure it out. What's your legacy going to be tonight? If you need to change your legacy, the opportunity presents itself right now as we stand and as we sing.